This is your reader, Terry Bible Night. We're on chapter 15 of C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. This one is called The Disappearance of Jill. The patch of light did not show up anything down in the darkness where they were standing. The others could only hear, not see, Jill's efforts to get onto the Marsh Wiggles' back. That is, they heard him saying, You needn't put your finger in my eye, and nor your foot in my mouth either, and that's more like it, and now I'll hold on to your legs. That'll leave your arms free to steady yourself against the earth. Then they looked up, and soon they saw the black shape of Jill's head against the patch of light. Well, they all shouted up anxiously. It's a hole, called Jill's voice. I could get through it if I was a little bit higher. What do you see through it? Added, asked Eustace. Nothing much yet, said Jill. I, I say, Puddle Glum, let go of my legs so I can stand on your shoulders instead of sitting on them. I can steady myself all right against the edge. They could hear her moving, and then much more of her came into sight against the grayness of the opening. In fact, all of her, down to the waist. I say, began Jill, but suddenly broke off with a cry, not a sharp cry. It sounded more as if her mouth had been muffled up or had something pushed into it. After that, she found her voice and seemed to be shouting out loud as she could, but they couldn't hear the words. Two things then happened at the same moment. The patch of light was completely blocked up for a second or so, and they heard both a scuffling, struggling sound and the voice of the marsh wiggle gasping, Quick, help, hold on to her legs, someone's pulling her. There, no, here, no, too late. The opening and the cold light which filled it were now perfectly clear again. Jill had vanished. Jill, Jill, they shouted frantically, but there was no answer. Why the dickens couldn't you have held her feet, asked Eustace. I don't know, scrub, groaned Puddle Glum. Born to be a misfit, I shouldn't wonder. Faded, faded to be Pole's death, just as I was fated to eat talking stag at Harfang. Not that it wasn't my own fault as well, of course. This is the greatest shame and sorrow that could have fallen on us, said the prince. We have sent a brave lady into the hands of enemies and stayed behind in safety. Don't paint it too black, sir, said Puddle Glom. We're not very safe except for death by starvation in this hole. I wonder, am I small enough to get through where Jill did, said Eustace. Now what had really happened to Jill was this. As soon as she got her head out of the hole, she found that she was looking down as if from an upstairs window, not up as if through a trap door. She'd been so long in the dark that her eyes couldn't at first take in what they were seeing, except that she was not looking at the daylit sunny world which she so wanted to see. The air seemed to be deadly cold and the light was pale and blue. There was also a good deal of noise going on and a lot of white objects flying about in the air. It was at that moment that she had shouted down to Puddle Glum to let her stand up on his shoulders. When she'd done this, she could hear and see a good deal better. The noises she had been hearing turned out to be of two kinds, the rhythmical thump of several feet and the music of four fiddles, three flutes, and a drum. She also got her own position clear. She was looking out of a hole in a steep bank which sloped down and reached the level about 14 feet below her. Everything was very white. A lot of people were moving about. Then she gasped. The people were trim little fawns and dryads with leaf-crowned hair floating behind them. For a second, they looked as if they were moving anyhow, and then she said they were really doing a dance. A dance with so many complicated steps and figures that it took you some time to understand it. Then it came over her like a thunderclap that the pale blue light was really moonlight and the white stuff on the ground was really snow. And of course, there were the stars staring in a black frosty sky overhead and the tall black things behind the dancers were trees. They not, had not only got out into the upper world at last, but had come out into the heart of Narnia. Jill felt she could have fainted with delight, and the music, the wild music, intensely sweet and yet just the least bit eerie too, and full of good magic, as the witch's thrumming had been full of bad magic, made her feel it all the more. Now all this takes a long time to tell, but of course it took a very short time to see. Jill turned almost at once to shout down to the others, I say, it's all right, we're out, we're home. But the reason she never got further than I say was this, circling round and round the dancers was a ring of dwarfs, all dressed in their finest clothes, mostly scarlet with fur-lined hoods and golden tassels and big furry top boots. As they circled round, they were all diligently throwing snowballs. Those were the white things that Jill had seen flying through the air. 
They weren't throwing them at the dancers, as silly boys might have been doing in England. They were throwing them through the dance in such perfect time with the music and with such perfect aim that if all the dancers were in exactly the right places at exactly the right moments, no one would be hit. This is called the Great Snow Dance, and it is done every year in Narnia on the first moonlit night when there is snow on the ground. Of course, it is a kind of game as well as a dance because every now and then some dancer will be the least little bit wrong and get a snowball in the face and then everyone laughs. But a good team of dancers, dwarfs, and musicians will keep it up for hours without a single hit. On fine nights when the cold and the drum taps and the hooting of the owls and the moonlight have got into their wild woodland blood and made it even wilder, they will dance until daybreak. I wish you could see it for yourselves. What had stopped Jill when she got as far as the say of I say was, of course, simply a fine big snowball that came sailing through the dance from a dwarf on the far side and got her fair and square in the mouth. She didn't in the least mind. Twenty snowballs would not have damped her spirits at that moment. But however happy you are feeling, you can't talk with your mouth full of snow. And when, after considerable sputtering, she could speak again, she quite forgot in her excitement that the others down in the dark behind her still didn't know the good news. She simply leaned as far out of the hole as she could and yelled to the dancers, Help! Help! We're buried in the hill! Come and dig us out! The Narnians, who had not even noticed the little hole in the hillside, were of course very surprised and looked about in several wrong directions before they found out where the noise was coming from. But when they caught sight of Jill, they all came running toward her, and as many as could scrambled up the bank. A dozen or more hands were stretched up to help her. And Jill caught hold of them and thus got out of the hole and came slithering down the bank head first, and there picked herself up and said, Oh, do go and dig the others out. There are three others besides the horses, and one of them is Prince Rillian. She was already in the middle of a crowd when she said this, for besides the dancers, all sorts of people who had been watching the dance, and whom she had not seen at first, came running up. Squirrels came out of the trees in showers, and so did owls. Hedgehogs came waddling as fast as their short legs could carry them. Bears and badgers followed at a slower pace. A great panther, twitching its tail with excitement, was the last to join the party. But as soon as they understood what Jill was saying, they all became active. Pick and shovel, boys, pick and shovel, off for our tools, said the dwarfs, and dashed away into the woods at top speed. Wake up some moles, they're good chaps for digging. They're quite as good as dwarfs, said a voice. What was that she said about Prince Rillian, said another? Hush, said the panther. The poor child's crazed, and no wonder, after being lost inside the hill, she doesn't know what she's saying. That's right, said an old bear. Well, she said Prince Rillian was a horse. No, she didn't, said a squirrel very pert. Yes, she did, said another squirrel, even perter. It's quite true. Don't don't, don't be so silly, said Jill. She spoke like that because her teeth were now chattering with the cold. Immediately, one of the dryads flung round her a furry cloak, which some dwarf had dropped when he rushed to fetch his mining tools, and an obliging fawn trotted off among the trees to a place where Jill could see firelight in the mouth of a cave to get her a hot drink. But before it came, all the dwarfs reappeared with spades and pickaxes and charged at the hillside. Then Jill heard cries of, Hey, what are you doing? Put that sword down. Hey, now, young, and none of that. I said, He's a vicious one now, isn't he? Jill hurried to the spot and didn't know whether to laugh or cry when she saw Eustace's face, very pale and dirty, projecting from the blackness of the hole, and Eustace's right hand brandishing a sword with which he made lunges at anyone who came near him. For, of course, Eustace had been having a very different time from Jill during the last few minutes. He'd heard Jill cry out and seen her disappear into the unknown. Like the prince in Puddleglum, he thought that some enemies had caught her and from down below he didn't see the pale bluish light was moonlight. He thought the hole would lead only into some other cave, lit by some ghostly phosphorescence and filled with goodness knows what evil creatures of the underworld. So when he had persuaded Puddleglum to give him a back and drawn his sword and poked out his head, he'd really been doing a very brave thing. The others would have done it first if they could, but the hole was too small for them to climb through. Eustace was a little bigger and a lot clumsier than Jill, so that when he looked out, he bumped his head against the top of the hole and brought a small avalanche of snow down on his face. So when he could see again and saw dozens of figures coming at him as hard as they could run, it's not surprising that he tried to ward them off. Stop, Eustace, stop, cried Jill. They're all friends. Can't you see? We've come up in Narnia. Everything's all right. Then Eustace did see, and apologized to the dwarfs, and the dwarfs said not to mention it, and dozens of thick, hairy, dwarfish hands helped him out just as they had helped Jill, 
out a few minutes before. Then Jill scrambled up the bank and put her head in at the dark opening and shouted the good news to the prisoners. As she turned away, she heard Puddle Glum mutter, Ah, poor Paul, it's been too much for her this last bit. Turned her head, I shouldn't wonder. She's beginning to see things. Jill rejoined Eustace, and they shook one another by both hands and took in great breaths of the free midnight air. A warm cloak was brought for Eustace and hot drinks for both. While they were sipping it, the dwarfs had already got all the snow and all the sods off a large strip of the hillside round the original hole, and the pickaxes and spades were now going as merrily as the feet of fawns and dryads had been going in the dance ten minutes before. Only ten minutes, and yet already it fell to Jill and Eustace as if all their dangers in the dark and heat and general smotheriness of the earth must have been only a dream. Out here in the cold, with the moon and the huge stars overhead, Narnian stars are nearer than stars in our world, and with kind merry faces all around them, one couldn't quite believe in Underland. Before they had finished their hot drinks, a dozen or so moles, newly waked and still very sleepy and not best pleased, had arrived. But as soon as they understood what it was all about, they joined in with a will. Even the fawns made themselves useful by carting away the earth in little barrows, and the squirrels danced and leaped to and fro in great excitement, though Jill never found out exactly what they thought they were doing. The bears and owls contented themselves with giving advice and kept on asking the children if they wouldn't like to come into the cave, that was where Jill had seen the firelight, and get warm and have supper. But the children couldn't bear to go without seeing their friends set free. No one in our world can work at a job of that sort as dwarfs and talking moles work in Narnia. But then, of course, moles and dwarfs don't look on it as work. They like digging. It was therefore not really long before they had opened a great black chasm in the hillside. And out from the blackness into the moonlight, this would have been rather dreadful if one hadn't known who they were, came first the long, leggy, steeple-hatted figure of the Marsh Wiggle, and then leading two great horses, Rillian the Prince himself. As Puddleglum appeared, shouts broke out on every side. Why, it's a wiggle. Why, it's old Puddleglum, old Puddleglum from the eastern marshes. Whatever have you been doing, Puddleglum? There have been search parties out for you. The Lord Trumpkin has been putting up notices. There's a reward. But all this died away, all in one moment, into dead silence, as quickly as the noise dies away in a rowdy dormitory, if the headmaster opens the door. For now they saw the prince. No one doubted for a moment who he was. There were plenty of beasts and dryads and dwarfs and fawns who remembered him from the days before his enchantment. There were some old ones who could just remember how his father, King Caspian, had looked when he was a young man and saw the likeness. But I think they would have known him anyway. Pale though he was, from long imprisonment in the deep lands, dressed in black, dusty, disheveled, and weary, there was something in his face and air which no one could mistake. That look is in the faces of all true kings of Narnia, who rule by the will of Aslan and sit at Caer Paravel in the throne of Peter the High King. Instantly, every head was bared and every knee was bent. A moment later, such cheering and shouting, such jumps and reels of joy, such handshakings and kissings and embracings of everybody by everybody else broke out, such that the tears came into Jill's eyes. Their quest had been worth all the pains it cost. Please it, your highness, said the oldest of the dwarves. There is some attempt at a supper in the cave yonder, prepared against the ending of the snow dance. With a good will, father, said the prince, for never had any prince, knight, gentleman, or bear so good a stomach to his vit victuals as we four wanderers have tonight. The whole crowd began to move away through the trees toward the cave. Jill heard Puddleglum saying to those who pressed round him, No, no, my story can wait. Nothing worth talking about has happened to me. I want to hear the news. Don't try breaking it to me gently, for I'd rather have it all at once. Has the king been shipwrecked? Any forest fires? No wars on the Callerman border? How about a few dragons, I shouldn't wonder? And all the creatures laughed aloud and said, Isn't that just like a marsh wiggle? The two children were nearly dropping with tiredness and hunger, but the warmth of the cave and the very sight of it, with the firelight dancing on the walls and dressers and cups and saucers and plates and on the smooth stone floor just as it does in a farmhouse kitchen, revived them a little. All the same, they went fast asleep while supper was being got ready, and while they slept, Prince Rillian was talking over the whole adventure with the older and wiser beasts and dwarfs, and now they all saw what it meant, how a wicked witch, doubtless the same kind as that white witch who had brought the great winter on Narnia long ago, had contrived the whole thing, first killing Rillian's mother and enchanting Rillian himself. 
and they saw how she had dug right under Narnia and was going to break out and rule it through Rillian, and how he had never dreamed that the country of which she would make him king, king in name, but really her slave, was his own country. And from the children's part of the story, they saw how she was in league and friendship with the dangerous giants of Harfang. And the lesson of it all is, your highness, said the oldest dwarf, that those northern witches always mean the same thing, but in every age they have a different plan for getting it. And that's the end of chapter 15. This is your reader, Terry Bivonite. We're on the final chapter of C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. This is chapter 16. It's called The Healing of Harms. When Jill woke next morning and found herself in a cave, she thought for one horrid moment that she was back in the underworld. But when she noticed that she was lying on a bed of heather with a furry mantle over her and saw a cheery fire crackling as if newly lit on a stone hearth and further off, morning sunlight coming in through the cave's mouth, she remembered all the happy truth. They had had a delightful supper, all crowded into that cave in spite of being so sleepy before it was properly over. She had a vague impression of dwarfs crowding round the fire with frying pans rather bigger than themselves and the hissing and delicious smell of sausages and more and more and more sausages. And not wretched sausages, half full of bread and soybean either, but real meaty, spicy ones, fat and piping hot and burst and just the tiniest bit burnt. And great mugs of frothy chocolate and roast potatoes and roast chestnuts and baked apples with raisins stuck in where the cores had been and then ices just to freshen you up after all the hot things. Jill sat up and looked around. Puddle Glum and Eustace were lying not far away, both fast asleep. Hey, you two, shouted Jill in a loud voice. Aren't you ever going to get up? Whew, shoo, said a sleepy voice somewhat where above her. Time to be settling down. Have a good snooze. Do, do, don't make a to-do. Why, I do believe, said Jill, glancing up at a white bundle of fluffy feathers which was perched on top of a grandfather clock in one corner of the cave. I do believe it's Glimfeather. True, true, whirred the owl, lifting its head out from under its wing and opening one eye. I came up with a message for the prince at about two. The squirrels brought us the good news. Message for the prince. He's gone. You're to follow too. Good day. And the head disappeared again. As there seemed no further hope of getting any information from the owl, Jill got up and began looking around for any chance of a wash and some breakfast. But almost at once, a little fawn came trotting into the cave with a sharp click-clack of his goaty hoofs on the stone floor. Ah, you've woken up at last, daughter of Eve, he said. Perhaps you'd better wake the son of Adam. You've got to be off in a few minutes, and two centaurs have very kindly offered to let you ride on their backs down to Care Paravel. He added in a lower voice, Of course you realize it is a most special and unheard of honor to be allowed to ride a centaur. I don't know that I ever heard of anyone doing it before. It wouldn't do to keep them waiting. Where's the prince? was the first question of Eustace and Puddleglum as soon as they had been waked. He's gone down to meet the king, his father, at Caraparavel, answered the fawn, whose name was Orans. His majesty's ship is expected in harbor any moment. It seems that the king met Aslan, I don't know whether it was in a vision or face to face, before he had sailed far, and Aslan turned him back and told him he would find his long-lost son awaiting him when he reached Narnia. Eustace was now up, and he and Jill set about helping Orans to get the breakfast. Puddleglum was told to stay in bed. A centaur called Cloudbirth, a famous healer, or as Orans called it, a leech, was coming to see to his burnt foot. Ah, said Puddleglum in a tone almost of contentment. He'll want to have the leg off at the knee, I shouldn't wonder. You see if he doesn't. But he was quite glad to stay in bed. Breakfast was scrambled eggs and toast, and Eustace tackled it just as if he had not had a very large supper in the middle of the night. I say, son of Adam, said the fawn, looking with a certain awe at Eustace's mouthfuls. There's no need to hurry quite so dreadfully as that. I don't think the centaurs have finished their breakfasts yet. Then they must have got up very late, said Eustace. I bet it's after ten o'clock. Oh, no, said Orans. They got up before it was light. Well, then they must have waited the dickens of a time for breakfast, said Eustace. No, they didn't, said Orans. They began eating the minute they awoke. Well, golly, said Eustace, did they eat a very big breakfast? Why, son of Adam, don't you understand? A centaur has a man's stomach and a horse stomach, and of course both want breakfast. So first of all, he has porridge and pavenders and kidneys and bacon and omelet and cold ham and toast and marmalade and coffee and beer. 
and after that he attends to the horse part of himself by grazing for an hour or so and finishing up with a hot mash, some oats, and a bag of sugar. That's why it's such a serious thing to ask a centaur to stay for the weekend. Very serious thing indeed. At that moment, there was a sound of horse hoofs tapping on rock from the mouth of the cave, and the children looked up. The two centaurs, one with black and one with a golden beard flowing over their magnificent bare chests, stood waiting for them, bending their heads a little so as to look into the cave. Then the children became very polite and finished their breakfast very quickly. No one thinks a centaur funny when he sees it. They are solemn, majestic people, full of ancient wisdom, which they learn from the stars, not easily made either merry or angry, but their anger is t- terrible as a tidal wave when it comes. Goodbye, dear Puddle Glum, said Jill, going over to the Marsh Wiggles' bed. I'm sorry we called you a wet blanket. So am I, said Eustace. You've been the best friend in the world. And I do hope we'll meet again, added Jill. Not much chance of that, I should say, replied Puddle Glum. I don't reckon I'm very likely to see my old wigwam again either. And that prince, he's a nice chap, but you think he's very strong. Constitution ruined with living underground, I shouldn't wonder. Looks the sort that might go off any day. Puddle Glum, said Jill, you're a regular old humbug. You sound as doleful as a funeral, and I believe you're perfectly happy. And you talk as if you were afraid of everything when you're really as brave as, as a lion. Now, speaking of funerals, began Puddle Glum, but Jill, who heard the centaurs tapping with their hoofs behind her, surprised him very much by flinging her arms round his thin neck and kissing his muddy-looking face while Eustace wrung his hand. Then they both rushed away to the centaurs, and the marsh wiggle, sinking back on his bed, remarked to himself, Well, I wouldn't have dreamt of her doing that, even though I am a good-looking chap. To ride on a centaur is, no doubt, a great honor. And except Jill and Eustace, there's probably no one alive in the world today who has had it. But it is very uncomfortable. For no one who valued his life would suggest putting a saddle on a centaur and riding bareback is no fun, especially if, like Eustace, you've never learned to ride at all. The centaurs were very polite in a grave, gracious, grown-up kind of way. And as they cantered through the Narnian woods, they spoke, without turning their heads, telling the children about the properties of herbs and roots, the influences of the planets, the nine names of Aslan with their meanings, and things of that sort. But however sore and jolted the two humans were, they would now give anything to have that journey over again, to see those glades and slopes sparkling with last night's snow, to be met by rabbits and squirrels and birds that wished you good morning, to breathe again the air of Narnia, and hear the voices of the Narnian trees. They came down to the river, flowing bright and blue in winter sunshine far below the last bridge, which is at the snug, red-roofed little town of Baruna, and were ferried across in a flat barge by the ferryman, or rather by the fairy wiggle, for it is marsh wiggles who do most of the watery and fishy kinds of work in Narnia. And when they had crossed, they rode along the south bank of the river and presently came to Care Paravel itself. At the very moment of their arrival, they saw that same bright ship which they had seen when they first set foot in Narnia, gliding up the river like a huge bird. All the court were once more assembled on the green between the castle and the quay to welcome King Caspian home again. Rillian, who had changed his black clothes and was now dressed in a scarlet cloak over silver mail, stood close to the water's edge, bareheaded, to receive his father, and the dwarf Trumpkin sat beside him in his little donkey chair. The children saw there would be no chance of reaching the prince through all that crowd, and anyway, they now felt rather shy. So they asked the centaurs if they might go on sitting on their backs a little longer and thus see everything over the heads of the courtiers, and the centaurs said they might. A flourish of silver trumpets came over the water from the ship's deck. The sailors threw a rope. Rats, talking rats, of course, and marsh wiggles made it fast ashore, and the ship was warped in. Musicians, hidden somewhere in the crowd, began to play solemn, triumphal music, and soon the king's galleon was alongside and the rats ran the gangway on board her. Jill expected to see the old king come down it, but there appeared to be some hitch. A lord with a pale face came ashore and knelt to the prince and to Trumpkin. The three were talking with their heads close together for a few minutes, but no one could hear what they said. The music played on, but you could feel that everyone was becoming uneasy. Then four knights, carrying something and going very slowly, appeared on deck. When they started to come down the gangway, you could see that what they were carrying. 
It was the old king on a bed, very pale and still. They set him down. The prince knelt beside him and embraced him. They could see King Caspian raising his hand to bless his son. And everyone cheered, but it was a half-hearted cheer, for they all felt that something was going wrong. Then suddenly the king's head fell back upon his pillows. The musicians stopped, and there was a dead silence. The prince, kneeling by the king's bed, laid down his head upon it and wept. There were whisperings and goings to and fro. Then Jill noticed that all who wore hats, bonnets, helmets, or hoods were taking them off, Eustace included. Then she heard a rustling and flapping noise up above the castle. When she looked, she saw that the great banner with the golden lion on it was being brought down to half-mast. And after that, slowly, mercilessly, with wailing strings and disconsolate blowing of horns, the music began again, this time a tune to break your heart. They both slipped off their centaurs, who took no notice of them. I wish I was at home, said Jill. Eustace nodded, saying nothing, and bit his lip. I have come, said a deep voice behind them. They turned and saw the lion himself, so bright and real and strong that everything else began at once to look pale and shadowy compared with him. And in less time than it takes to breathe, Jill forgot about the dead king of Narnia and remembered only how she had made Eustace fall over the cliff and how she'd helped to muff nearly all the signs and about all the snappings and quarrelings. She wanted to say, I'm sorry, but she could not speak. Then the lion drew them towards him with his eyes and bent down and touched their pale faces with his tongue and said, Think of that no more. I will not always be scolding. You have done the work for which I sent you into Narnia. Please, Aslan, said Jill. May we go home now? Yes, I've come to bring you home, said Aslan. Then he opened his mouth wide and blew, but this time they had no sense of flying through the air. Instead, it seemed that they remained still, and the wild breath of Aslan blew away the ship and the dead king and the castle and the snow and the winter sky. For all of these things floated off into the air like wreaths of smoke, and suddenly they were standing in a great brightness of midsummer sunshine on smooth turf among mighty trees and beside a fair, fresh stream. Then they saw that they were once more on the mountain of Aslan, high up above and beyond the end of the world in which Narnia lies. But the strange thing was that the funeral music for King Caspian still went on, though no one could tell where it came from. They were walking beside the stream, and the lion went before them, and he became so beautiful and the music so despairing that Jill did not know which of them it was that filled her eyes with tears. Then Aslan stopped, and the children looked into the stream. And there, on the golden gravel of the bed of the stream, lay King Caspian, dead, with the water flowing over him like liquid glass. His long white beard swayed in it like water weed, and all three stood and wept. Even the lion wept, great lion tears, each tear more precious than the earth would be if it was a single solid diamond. And Jill noticed that Eustace looked neither like a child crying nor like a boy crying and wanting to hide it, but like a grown-up crying. At least that's the nearest she could get to it, but really, as she said, people don't seem to have any particular ages on that mountain. Son of Adam, said Aslan, go into that thicket and plunk, pluck the thorn that you will find there and bring it to me. Eustace obeyed. The thorn was a foot long and sharp as a rapier. Drive it into my paw, son of Adam, said Aslan, holding up his right forepaw and spreading out the great pad toward Eustace. Must I, said Eustace. Yes, said Aslan. Then Eustace set his teeth and drove the thorn into the lion's pad, and there came out a great drop of blood, redder than all redness that you have ever seen or imagined, and it splashed into the stream over the dead body of the king. At the same moment, the doleful music stopped, and the dead king began to be changed. His white beard turned to gray and from gray to yellow and got shorter and vanished altogether and his sunken cheeks grew round and fresh and the wrinkles were smoothed and his eyes opened and his eyes and lips both laughed and suddenly he leaped up and stood before them, a very young man or a boy. But Jill couldn't say which because of people having no particular ages in Aslan's country. Even in this world, of course, it is the stupidest children who are most childish and the stupidest grown-ups who are most grown up. And he rushed to Aslan and flung his arms as far as they would go round the huge neck, and he gave Aslan the strong kisses of a king, and Aslan gave him the wild kisses of a lion. 
At last, Caspian turned to the others. He gave a great laugh of astonished joy. Why, Eustace, he said. Eustace, so you did reach the end of the world after all. What about my second best sword that you broke on the sea serpent? Eustace made a step towards him with both hands held out, but then drew back with a startled expression. Look here, I say, he said, but it's all very well, but aren't you, I mean, didn't you? Don't be such an ass, said Caspian. But, said Eustace, looking at Aslan, hasn't he died? Yes, said the lion in a very quiet voice, almost, Jill thought, as if he were laughing. He has died. Most people have, you know. Even I have. There are very few who haven't. Oh, said Caspian, I see what's bothering you. You think I'm a ghost or some nonsense, but don't you see? I would be that if I appeared in Narnia now, because I don't belong there anymore. But one can't be a ghost in one's own country. I might be a ghost if I got into your world. I don't know. But I suppose it isn't yours either now you're here. A great hope rose in the children's hearts. But Aslan shook his shaggy head. No, my dears, he said, when you meet me here again, you will have come to stay, but not now. You must go back to your own world for a while. Sir, said Caspian, I've always wanted to have just one glimpse of their world. Is that wrong? You cannot want wrong things any more now that you have died, my son, said Aslan. You shall see their world for five minutes of their time. It will take no longer for you to set things right there. Then Aslan explained to Caspian that what Jill and Eustace were going back to and all about Experiment House. He seemed to know it quite as well as they did. Daughter, said Aslan to Jill, flick a switch off that, bro- off that bush. She did, and as soon as it was in her hand, it turned into a fine new riding crop. Now, sons of Adam, draw your swords, said Aslan, but use only the flat, for it is cowards and children, not warriors, against whom I send you. Are you coming with us, Aslan, said Jill? They shall see only my back, said Aslan. He led them rapidly through the wood, and before they had gone many paces, the wall of Experiment House appeared before them. Then Aslan roared so that the sun shook in the sky, and thirty feet of the wall fell down before them. They looked through the gap, down into the school shrubbery, and onto the roof of the gym, all under the same dull autumn sky which they had seen before their adventures began. Aslan turned to Jill and Eustace and breathed upon them and touched their foreheads with his tongue. Then he lay down amid the gap he had made in the wall and turned his golden back to England and his lordly face toward his own lands. At the same moment, Jill saw figures whom she knew only too well running up through the laurels toward them. Most of the gang were there, Adela Pennyfeather and Chalmondley Major, Edith Winterblot, Spotty Sorner, Big Bannister, and the two loathsome Garrett twins. But suddenly they stopped. Their faces changed, and all the meanness, conceit, cruelty, and sneakishness almost disappeared in one single expression of terror. For they saw the wall fallen down, and a lion as large as a young elephant lying in the gap, and three figures in glittering clothes with weapons in their hands rushing down upon them. For with the strength of Aslan in them, Jill plied her crop on the girls, and Caspian and Eustace plied the flats of their swords on the boys so well that in two minutes all the bullies were running like mad, crying out, Murder! Fascists! Lions! It isn't fair! And then the head, who was, by the way, a woman, came running out to see what was happening. And when she saw the lion and the broken wall and Caspian and Jill and Eustace, whom she quite failed to recognize, she had hysterics and went back to the house and began ringing up the police with stories about a lion escaped from a circus and escaped convicts who broke down walls and carried drawn swords. In the midst of all this fuss, Jill and Eustace slipped quietly indoors and changed out of their bright clothes into ordinary things, and Caspian went back into his own world. And the wall, at Aslan's word, was made whole again. When the police arrived and found no lion, no broken wall, and no convicts, and the head behaving like a lunatic, there was an inquiry into the whole thing. And in the inquiry, all sorts of things about Experiment House came out, and about ten people got expelled. After that, the head's friends saw the head was no use as a head, so they got her made an inspector to interfere with other heads. And when they found she wasn't much good even at that, they got her into Parliament, where she lived happily ever after. Eustace buried his fine clothes secretly one night in the school grounds, but Jill smuggled hers home and wore them at a fancy dress ball next holidays. And from that day forth, things changed for the better at Experiment House, and it became quite a good school, and Jill and Eustace were always friends. 
But far off in Narnia, King Rillian buried his father, Caspian the Navigator, tenth of that name, and mourned for him. He himself ruled Narnia well, and the land was happy in his days, though Puddleglum, whose foot was as good as new in three weeks, often pointed out that bright mornings brought on wet afternoons, and you couldn't expect good times to last. The opening into the hillside was left open, and often, on hot summer days, the Narnians go in there with ships and lanterns and down to the water and sail to and fro, singing on the cool, dark, underground sea, telling each other stories of the cities that lie fathoms deep below. If ever you have the luck to go to Narnia yourself, do not forget to have a look at those caves. And that is the end of The Silver Chair.